What's up guys, welcome back to the channel and we're here with the first MMA rant video. I'm going to make this maybe like a weekly or every two weeks kind of thing. Anytime there's a bunch of topics to talk about in the MMA world that are annoying me and just narratives going around that piss me off or things the UFC are doing that annoy me a lot, I'm going to make a video. I've got uh, eight, I think eight, yeah, I've got eight topics here to talk about and then also you guys left your rants slash comments or questions or whatever in the comments and I'll talk about those at the end of the video. But let's take a look at the topics we're going over. So first topic, we've got the Umana Magomedov Glazers rant. We've then got the meaningless champ champ fights rant. Bo Nickel on 300 main card. We're talking about Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson. We're talking about Colby Covington and the fact he's above Jack Della in the rankings. I'm going to talk about the fraud check narratives that are going around. I'm going to briefly talk about the Cheeto Vera copium. And then I'm going to talk about what are they doing with Tough and the recent announcement that Shevchenko Grasso is coaching Tough. And then obviously at the end of the video, we're going to go through the people's takes. But let's get started with the Umar Namagamedov rant. All right, first of all, I just want to say... How is this guy ranked number 10? He's beat no one ranked. He's beat no one good. And he's somehow ranked number 10. Let, let's take a look at this incredible resume that you can see on your screen here. Sergey Morozov, Brian Kelleher, Hayoni Barcelos, Nate Maness, and Bexat Almakan. Yeah, that sounds like a top 10 resume to me. Like, why is this guy ranked? That pisses me off. Also, even if he was or should be ranked number 10... Why the fuck is he fighting Corey? I get it. Corey's calling for the fight. I think Corey's kind of retarded, to be honest with you. But um, I don't know why Corey wants to fight him. He's coming off three wins. Corey, you're like a win away from a title shot, bro. Why are you trying to fight Umar? Also, people just talking about like, yeah, you know, Umar versus Corey, it's the next fight to make. It's so obvious. You make that fight. That's the fight that you need to see for Umar. It's like, bro, he's beat no one. His best win is Hayoni Barcelos. Like, what are we doing here? Also, like, this guy just arguably, like, everyone's like, oh, damn, he's so cool. Like, good job, Umar, for fighting down the rankings, fighting an unranked guy. Like, bro, can we, I think we need to see him fight a few more unranked guys, to be honest, to be honest with you. I don't even know what to do. Um, but, like, can we see this guy versus, like, a fucking Ricky Simone or something? Or, like, one of these guys? I don't know. Or even if he's going to fight a top 10 guy, like a Song Yedong or like a Cheeto Vera even would I wouldn't hate. But like why the fuck is he getting number three Corey Sanhagen after he pulled out the first time they fought? Like chicken um, pulled out the first time they fought and then it was like everyone's ducking me. I don't no one wants to fight me. It's like, yeah, well, bro, you pulled out of a top five opportunity, which you didn't even deserve. So Umar Namagomedov, the preferential treatment is crazy. Also... I'm hearing people like on MMA fighting, which I like. The MMA fighting crew on YouTube are a good good team. I listen to all, a lot of their podcasts and stuff. But the guys are just acting like Umar is just the fucking future next champion and no one ever is going to beat him and he's just undeniable, undoubtable. If you think he's going to lose, then you're delusional and he's just the best thing to ever exist since Khabib. Like, I know. His name's Namagomedov, so you immediately just assume he's going to be the fucking messiah of the universe and just the best grappler to ever exist. Like, I hate to break it to you, he literally got dropped by a fucking debuting guy in the first 30 seconds of the fight. He's open as fuck on the feet, and sorry, Lucas Tracy's glazing the guy for throwing a bunch of ground and pound, like sick. You got the guy down, you threw some ground and pound against a guy that looked like he was 20 pounds less than you in the cage. So yeah, cool. You landed some shots and you got a fucking 30-25 or 30-26 after literally getting dropped and put on your ass. Like cool, you have some good wrestling. Let's see you actually like uh, take down anyone good or beat anyone good or... How about you get some finishes on the ground, little bro? Like, cool, you beat 37-year-old Hayoni Barcelos by KO on the feet. Uh, and then apart from that, you took Nate Maness to decision, I'm pretty sure. You su you subbed Kelleher, who sucks. Like, Brian Kelleher lost to Cody Garbrandt. Um, and I, I, exactly. Um, but Cody Garbrandt, like, I mean, he's all right, but come on. Like, Brian Kelleher, we're going to act like that's an impressive win just because he's getting a submission. Like, and then what, Sergei Morozov? Like, he's all right. That was ages ago. But... Can we actually see him get some, like, interesting wins? Like, there are so many... And also, the fact he's ranked number 10, above Cruz, above Munoz, above Kyla Phillips, above Mario Batista, like, what the fuck are these rankings? Also, 
there's so many guys at Bantamweight that deserve to be ranked over him. Like, Saeed Magomedov, I would have ranked over him just based off level of opposition that he's beaten. Um, Damon Blackshear, also a bunch of great wins. Ricky Simone, even though he's coming off a couple losses, still deserves to be above Umar in the rankings. Like, Marcus McGee, Adrian Yanez, all these guys have beat better opposition than fucking Umar. Maybe not Marcus McGee, but like, like Rinya Nakamura and stuff. These are he's better. I'm just naming guys that are better than all the opposition Umar's beaten, and they're all outside the rankings. Like Daniel Santos, all these guys. I don't know why the fuck Umar, out of all people, is ranked number ten, and he moved up three spots in the rankings for beating some debuting guy on short notice that was just coming in, and in his last fight, he was literally fighting on rugs in a fucking cage, so, Umar Namagomedov, quit acting like he's just the fucking best thing to ever exist, quit acting like no one has a chance in hell to beat him, quit acting like he deserves a top five guy, he arguably doesn't even deserve a top ten guy, because he shouldn't be ranked number ten, he should have to actually beat some people, but, obviously, yeah, he gets a top ten guy, fair play, I'm not going to complain about that, but, versus Song Yudong, versus someone coming off a loss, why you gotta? Why are we fighting Corey Sanhagen, who's coming off three wins over top ten guys? Corey Sa- or like top fifteen guys. Corey Sanhagen coming off wins over Cheeto, Rob Font, and Song Yedong, all top ten guys. I'm pretty sure. And yeah, he's got to fight down seven spots in the rankings and fight Umar, who's coming off a good win streak against all like sub pass sub. I wouldn't even rank anyone he's beaten in the top 40 of the bantamweight division right now. And he's getting... And people are like, yeah, you know, he's one fight away from a title shot. I heard someone saying, like, O'Malley's got so much work to do before he moves up, which I agree with, so I'm going to talk about that later on. But he's like, you know, Marab, he's got Corey, you've got Umar. It's like, Umar? What the fuck? We're just, act, we're just casually chucking Umar with no ranked wins in the same title shot conversation as Marab and Corey. Like, what the fuck is this? So, yeah, Umar and Magomedov. Glazing is just unbearable. He's somehow ranked number 10. This is pissing me off. I know he's a great fighter. Could he be a champion? Absolutely. Could he just take down a whole bunch of people because he's got inbred grip strength? Absolutely. But can we quit acting like this guy is not extremely vulnerable on the feet and that he couldn't just get fucking sniped at range? Yeah. Quit glazing Umana Magomedov, bro. You're like, you're not Dagestani, that he's not going to suck your dick, he's not going to let you have sex with his pet goat, so just calm down, bro, and yeah, quick glaze on Umar, let's see him actually beat someone good, and then we can talk, like, if he just runs through and finishes Song Yudong, finishes Yudong, you know, pause, but that, that, I'll be like, alright, sick, you can maybe be looking at, like, a Cheeto fight, you can be looking at, like, a Cejudo fight, guy around number five, um, then I'll be like, alright, I have higher expectations of you, but come on, let's let's see him actually beat someone good, and then the glazing can resume. But right now, you, you you're glazing too much. You're doing tricks on it. You're not working at Dunkin' Donuts, bro. Calm down. So yeah, chill out. We move on though to the next rant. I'm gonna get annoyed about meaningless champ champ fights for the foreseeable future until people actually start fighting the fucking contenders in their own division. So. My main issue here, there's four guys that you can see on the screen. We've got Ilya Tapoya, Sean O'Malley, Islam Makachev, and Leon Edwards. And all four of them have talked about, I want to move up. I want to become a fucking double champ. Leon, not so much. Islam, not as much. But fucking O'Malley and Ilya, the kings of getting one, and in Ilya's case, zero title defenses. And then being like, yeah, you know, give me a, give me a fucking champ, champ opportunity. I'll beat Islam Makachev or I'll beat Ilya. Calm down, bro. Defend the belt in your own fucking division. So, O'Malley, um, I sound out of breath here. What the fuck? <laughs> Let me just calm down. But, um, O'Malley, you got to beat Marab. You got to beat Corey. Then you'll have three. So, like, if you did it then, I wouldn't hate it. But I would still say you need more, like, maybe a yarn rematch. Or if Umar does get to it by then, then you could fight Umar in, like, a couple years' time. Uh, Ilya Tapoya. Bruv, you've got no defenses. What the fuck are you talking about? You're not fighting Makachev. So, you got to rematch Volk. You've got to beat Max if he comes back down. Then you got to beat like a Arnold Allen or a Movzar Evlov or an Ortega. And then maybe even another one. Like, I think four defenses actually should be the minimum before going up. Like, three bare minimum, but I think it should be four. Like, Volkanovski, um, he had five defenses before... I uh, know four. It was it four or five? Because he he defended against Max the first uh, in the rematch, then Ortega, then Zombie, then Holloway again. So yeah, 
Volk got four defenses, and that was like that was like cleared out the division though. So if you haven't cleared out, like there's still contenders, you still got to fight contenders. But for Volk's case, he had four, but he had cleared out the division, um, or like he just fucking whooped Max in the trilogy, so he deserved it. But like Ilya Tapuria, at least at least two, like minimum. Like I would still think that would be unfair, but still, if you beat Volk in the rematch and then beat Holloway coming back down then all right, fair play, maybe you can go up. But for O'Malley, you've got more work to do given that there's actually more guys in your division to fight. Like, Marab, Corey, you've got to get those two done this year, I would prefer. Get those done this year, be active, be an active champion, get those two under your belt this year, and then maybe you can, like, and then one more, and then you can maybe talk about it. And for Islam, he's kind of mentioned it a little bit. The UFC even offered him the Leon fight for 300 because they were desperate. Um, and so Islam, you've got two defenses against Volk, who's a featherweight, and I love Volk, but come on, you've got to defend against someone in your own division, so beat both the winner of Holloway Gaethje and the winner of Charles, um, Armin, you've got to do at least those two, if you fight Dustin before then, like if they booked a Poirier fight for June, beat him, then beat the winner of Oliveira Armin, then beat the winner of Gaethje Holloway, and then that'll be five defenses, we can talk, um, because I know two of, like, okay, fair play, yes, the Volk win, fair and square, he beat him, but let, how much, like, are we gonna rate that as a title defense as the same as, like, Volkanovsky 50-45 and Holloway in the trilogy, like, there's different levels of title, like, come on, you're beating a guy coming up on short notice, from the division below, like, that's not the same level of defense, so I say you need to at least get, uh, I want him to fight twice this year minimum, um, because, you know, he took the first half of the year off for whatever knows reason, but yeah, beat, um, if you fight Poirier in June, beat him, then they could do him in, like, I would like to see him just go fucking straight back around and fight in August, two months later, but I know, uh, Dagestanis, you know, they're never going to make quick turnarounds. So I'd say get him maybe in like October or September or any of those fights, get him there and then make him fight early 25. So three more times, I think, for Islam, then he can move up. But yeah, meaningless champ champ fights. It takes the fucking point out of it. And Lucas Glazy, fucking Flukas Glazy, um, this guy's talking about like, oh, but if we do Marab and Marab beats O'Malley, then we're never going to get to see Ilya versus Sean, which is such a sick fight. I mean, like, yeah, we can still see it if Sean just wants to go up to featherweight. But uh, maybe I'm crazy for this. If you can't beat the guys in your own division, we don't need to find out if you can beat the champion in the division above. Like, it, it's so dumb to think like, oh, you know, he could lose uh, in his own division as the champion. And then we miss out on this amazing champ champ fight. It's like, but the only reason you think it's cool is because they both like they both have belts. If O'Malley loses his belt, then it's the, you don't even care about the fight. So it's not the fact you want to see Ilya fight O'Malley. It's just the fact that you're a fucking casual who only has eyes for all shiny belts and two fucking belts and go, oh, it's the best thing ever. Like if we see if we do a fight, like if we did a fight between fucking like when Jan Blahovic was the champion, like yeah, let's do a fight between fucking Blahovic and Ngannou. Yeah, that's fucking brilliant. Need need to see this. Like even Izzy when he went up to fight Blahovic was shit. Like no one, who cared? It was dumb. Like. He got a shitty defense against fucking Romero, and then he whooped Costa, but like, come on, two defenses and you're going up, I ain't having that, so, champ champ fights, pissing me off, fucking stay in your own division, it's more impressive to get five defenses than it is to become double champion, and I will stand by that till the end of time. Uh, We move on though to the next rant, I'm taking a while here. (laughs) Bo Nickel is on the UFC 300 main card, I repeat, Bo Nickel is on the UFC 300 main card. I'm not the first person to talk about this. I'm not the first person to get annoyed about this because everyone should be annoyed by this. Uh, you you want me to just read out some of the fights on the UFC 300 prelims? I don't even have the card with me. I'm just going to go off the top of my head. Figueredo versus Garbrandt, Aljo versus Kada, Yuri versus Rakic, even fucking Jim Miller versus Bobby Green deserves to be on the main card over this, like, there's so many fights, even fucking, I'd prefer Lopez on the main card over Bo Nickel against Cody Bumdidge, what the fuck is this abomination, Dana White, I thought what we, I was happy with the 300 card, this 300, even Turner versus Moicano, sick fight, I'm probably missing one as well, like, Oliveira versus Armin is slated below this on the card, which is retarded, but, look, if this is the main card opener, it's still bad, and I'm not gonna like it, but it's better. But if you do Oliveira Armin 
and then you do this, and then you do Gate Shoe Holloway. That's just all kinds of whack, and I'm not having it. Um, but when, because this was like one of the first three fights announced. The first three fights they announced for 300 was Yuri versus Rakic, Eldra versus Kader, and this. And I was like, okay. It makes sense. I was expecting Bo Nickel on 300. He's going to open the prelims. And we were all cool with that. We're like, okay, he's fighting a can. The fight, it means nothing. But at least we're going to open the card with Bo Nickel. And we don't have to do all these fucking main card opener. Because he, he literally was on the main card for UFC 285, John Jones's return. And he's on the main card for International Fight Week. Like... And now he's on the main card for 300. If he was on the main card of the fucking Canada pay-per-view, I'd be like, all right, sick. Like, if they put him on 297, they could have made him the feature fight for all I care. They could have made him the co-main. I would have been less mad with a co-main event on a pay-per-view, Bo Nickel, if it was 297, than I am with this anywhere, ab- anywhere above the early prelim opener. Like, this... Look at the names on this card. Every single one of them should be above Bo Nickel versus Cody Brundage. I get it. You're trying to build him up. And yes, it probably will add a couple pay-per-views to this card. Just because Bo Nickel's like 50-year-old... Uh, you look like a 50-year-old retired skateboarder. Um, but like Bo Nickel's 50-year-old American college wrestling fans and shit that all wrestled in high school... MMA Guru talked about this. That's the fan base that he has, the Chael Sonnens of the world, you know, the Brendan Schaubs of the world that are acting like this guy's already a champion. And it, Brendan Schaub, when I watched Drickus, I watched Joe Rogan's um, The Fight Companion for the Drickus Strickland card, and then Brendan Schaub's like, so why, why don't they get, uh, I don't know how to do a Schaub impression, it's like, why don't they get Bo Nickel in there? This guy run over all of these guys. It's like, bruv, he beat Jamie Pickett, who's no longer in the promotion, uh, who literally went 0-5 to end his career and retired again after a loss to Eric Anders. So he beat that guy. That's a sick win, you know, top five caliber right there. And then he beat the GOAT, Val Woodburn, who's now down at 170 and just lost the 30-27 decision to some Welsh fuck named Oban Elliott. So yeah, Bo Nickel, the resume is stacking up tremendously. Um, but yeah, no, I get it. He's an incredible athlete. He's a great fighter. Um, he definitely displays a lot of skill, but... Why would you not build this guy? If you're going to give him cans, you know what I say? Give him cans every two months and put him as like the paper, uh, the um, the headlining prelim. That's what I would do. If you're going to, if you want to actually build him up and give him like good fighters, then I get it. Take some time off, bring him back for like after this, bring him back for international fight week on the main card against a good opposition, like a top fifteen guy. But if you're going to keep giving him cans, how about you go? All right, let's get like give fans something to be excited for even put him on like fight night main cards that would be a good thing too that would you know take him i don't know where he's from like he penn state wrestler i'm pretty sure so get him over there um but there's so many dead cards that could like have bo nickel on them and then it's like sick you don't need to always have him on pay-per-view and also unless they somehow picked up a metric that bo nickel on his own sells like 50k buys extra then i don't know why you need him on the main card of 300 especially i get it i know exactly why they're doing it but it's also fucking pointless because they're basically saying here's this big card we're going to promote the fuck out of 300 and you know, people are just going to be forced to have this on the main card, and they're going to obviously pay for it because it's a sick card, but come on, what are we doing here? But, okay, I'll give them credit, at least Holly Holm versus Kayla Harrison is not on the main card, because when that got announced, I was like, bruv, if this gets put on the main card, I'm going to kill myself, because I was still defending it. When Lucas Tracy was wearing a fucking cardboard bag over his head, screaming on a YouTube video saying the 300 card is awful, I was the one saying, nah, it's a fucking great card, shut up. But I was worried about the card placement, and they've obviously... They haven't done a great job. I would have preferred if I was doing the card placement myself, I would have done, obviously, Pereira Hill main event, Gaethje Holloway co-main. I would have done, just because it's a title fight, you do Wei Li versus Yan as the feature fight, you do Oliveira Armin as the next one before that, and then you open up the card. I would have said you open up the card with Figueredo Garbrandt just for a quick knockout because I heard someone saying the other day the reason that they're putting it on the main card is just so it's like, because a bunch of the fights might go long because there's three five-rounders. Um, and so they're saying like, oh, we need a one to speed up the pacing. Like, bro, it's UFC 300. They're going to be running 30-minute ad commercials in between fucking fights. Like, they don't care. About the U- You really think the UFC's reason for this is, yeah, the pacing of the card, man. Like, we, we really got to make sure that um 
we have a quick finish. Like, if they wanted a quick finish, they could have just chucked Figueredo Garbant because Cody's going to get fucking chinned in the first two minutes and it's going to be tremendous. But another long rant there about Bo Nickel on the 300 main card. Also, I just don't know why. Like, I get it. People are hyped about him. But it's the same thing with Umar. Like, can we just at least see this guy beat somewhat of a high-level opposition? Like, can we see this guy beat, like, a grappler? Like, should have chucked him in there with, like, Paul Craig. If they put in Paul Craig on the main card, it would still be dumb, but at least Paul Craig's, like, a name and also is ranked. So this that would have at least done something. And then if he beats Paul Craig and runs through him and subs him, you're like, sick, he just subbed and ran through a jiu-jitsu expert. At least that's somewhat marketable, but, like, bruv, Cody Brundage. The only highlights they're going to be showing of Cody Brundage is him taking a fucking DQ against Jacob Malkoon and then getting a slap. One, he's got one highlight in his entire career, and it was just slamming some random dude on that Austin card. But anyway, another long rant. Bo Nickel, get him off the main card. It's an abomination. But we move on to the next rant. Jake Paul is a scumbag and he's a terrible human being and uh, he deserves to be jumped and put into a coma. Um, you know, see, normally you might say, why would you say that? Are you not worried you're going to get demonetized or taken down? I'm like, no, I'm not worried. Because one, I'm not monetized. And two, I don't give a fuck if I get taken down. I'm saying the truth. But yeah, Jake Paul is an awful human and he's a terrible person. He's a vain little piece of shit that only cares about his ego and thinks this whole fucking thing, this whole YouTube boxing, Mike Tyson boxing 50-year-old retired MMA fighters and now 60-year-old retired boxers whose fucking prime was literally 40 years ago, um, he's, the entire reason he's doing this is just as a fucking vanity project for him to be like, look, guys, I'm a legitimate boxer. I'm beating all these guys. Like, I hate this guy so much. Jake Paul, play, also, to any fans, look, I'm not... I'm going to blame Jake Paul because he shouldn't have tried to pursue this fight because it's just a scummy move. And if he beats Mike Tyson, it means nothing. Um, But also, any fans that are genuinely like, this is good, we like this, unless for some reason you're delusional and think that Mike Tyson, whose best performances was literally 35, 40 years ago, unless you think that guy's going to suddenly come back and uh, as a 60-year-old man knock out Jake Paul... And you just and you genuinely believe that, and you actually think that he's going to win. Okay, I get maybe you like this because we all want to see Jake Paul get knocked out. But go watch Mike Tyson versus Roy Jones Jr. The fucking the dumb little exhibition-y kind of thing that they had. Like, look, he didn't look awful. He didn't look like an absolute scrub. He didn't look like the fucking Uber driver that Jake Paul last fought. But come on, we're not acting like this guy is like a top level boxer anymore. And I don't care about videos of him cracking pads and smacking mitts and shit looking like a beast, which he does. He, he'd knock me the fuck out, I'll tell you that much. Like, I, I'm not saying he's not good. I'm not saying he doesn't have knockout power. Power is the last thing to go. People keep their power for years. But his durability is going to be shit. That's just going to exist. He's not going to be able to take punches properly. His speed when he's in the cage and his reaction time is not going to be that good. Jake Paul is just going to fucking stick him with a jab. Mike Tyson's going to try and do his little peekaboo, come in, and then Jake Paul's just going to crack him, and Mike's going to have no fucking chin and just get probably knocked, not knocked out clean, but he's going to get dropped. Or if Jake is just as shit as I think he is um, and doesn't find that power shot, then he's probably just going to win a fucking decision. So I would love to see Mike Tyson knock Jake out, but the reality is he was fucking requiring a wheelchair or a fucking cane to walk around and literally is not in like physical health of someone that should be competing in top-level professional sports. That's just the truth of it. That's how it exists. And fucking pad footage is not going to make me think that we're suddenly going to see them fucking Mike Tyson that was just knocking seven guys out in one year back in 1980. Like, this is not happening. Um, So yeah, Jake Paul, you're a scumbag. We move on to the next rant though. I also forgot to say, boxing, get your shit together. Your cards are a fucking mess. Saudi's taking all your big boxing fights and killing the atmosphere. Your pacing takes fucking forever. You literally have 30 minute waits in between fights. I swear to God, you're, you schedule a fight to take place at like 10 p.m. and it takes place at fucking 12.30 a.m. Like, the next day. Like, the fuck are you doing? Get your shit together. Stop just selling out to fucking oil tycoons in Saudi Arabia to take all your fights and have no actual boxing fans there and just pay celebrities to come out to make it look like it's a big deal. Actually put your fucking fights in America with actual combat sports fans 
and uh, get your shit together and speed up the pacing a little bit because your shows are terrible. I just wanted to mention that too. But the next rant that we move on to, this one's just a quick one. Colby Covington is ranked above Jack Della Maddalena and it pisses me off to be honest. So Colby Covington, as you can see on screen, if you look closely, his record, five fights since uh, 2019 when he lost, since his uh, first fight to Kamaru Usman where he lost, he's fought five times. Take a look at that record. A loss to Usman, a win over Tyron Woodley, a loss to Usman, a win over Jorge Masvidal, and a loss to Leon Edwards. Colby has zero wins over current ranked welterweights and zero wins over people that are actively fighting in the welterweight division. The one person he has fought and beaten in his entire career that still fights at welterweight in any aspect is RDA. That should say enough. Colby Covington, he's literally beaten no... Jorge Masvidal is about to... I'm not going to talk about this and rant about this because I don't really care enough, but fucking... Cor, not Corey. Colby Covington's last win is against obese, blown out of shape, 40-year-old Jorge Masvidal, who then went on to... Who, who was already past his prime. He was shit already. He wrestled him for five rounds. Good job, good win. You then take a year and a half off to wait for your title shot, claiming that, you know, no one wanted to fight me, no one wanted to fight me. Bullshit. Just bullshit. Um, also, you then come back, shit, a fuck, shit the bed against Leon Edwards, produce one of the worst performances in a title fight that I've ever seen from a challenger, and don't blame it on breaking your foot in because you didn't come into the fight with an injury. You did not come into the fight with an injury, so don't be like, I was compromised coming into the fight. You threw a kick... And if you did actually break your foot in the first 30 seconds, tough luck. People break their hands and their feet and shit all the time. Robert Whittaker fought like three or four rounds with, I'm pretty sure it was like, was a broken hand or broken forearm against Yoel Romero. Jack Della, the man I'm talking about in this context with Colby, broke his arm in the first round against Gilbert Burns and went on to finish him. So don't use your shitty excuse and say, oh, I hurt my foot because I kicked his elbow. That's your fault, bro. You're the one that threw a shitty kick at his elbow. You're not a kickboxer. Why are you throwing head kicks? The fuck are you doing? But I'm not going to peep anyone like these fucking dumb Colby glazers that are just be like, yeah, man, he beats Leon if he doesn't injure himself. Like, fuck off. People injure themselves in fights. It's called fighting. You're not fucking, you're not playing touch buck with a dork in the park. Like, what are we doing here? People throw kicks. They throw punches. People break their own bones from throwing stuff. People break other people's bones from throwing stuff at them. Shit happens in fighting, bro. If you don't want to fucking... If you're not going to be able to perform with a couple injuries, then don't fucking sign up to the sport. And I get it. Colby is a great fighter. And in his prime, he was an incredible fighter. But he's not in his prime anymore. He has not displayed any performance or any win to demonstrate that he should be even a top 10 let alone top five welterweight. And now he's calling out Ian Gary on social media, which I like in terms of, yes, that Ian Gary fight is the fight to make. And if you win that, you get my respect back somewhat. And then you can be like, okay, I'm actually, I've got a win over a current fighter who's undefeated in the UFC. Then you'll be like, sick, Colby top five guy for sure. But stop. I know you've got the whole little fucking Trump fucking MAGA personality that you want to push because you have no reason to, you have no way to get fans other than that. So you're pushing your whole little gimmick act, but stop making fucking stipulations for your fights. Just sign a contract and get in the cage. If you're injured right now, okay, fine. I'm not going to tell you to fight while injured, to start a camp while injured, but heal up, recover with your fucking foot injury. Stop making dumb stipulations and acting like you're just the only one that can choose which fights to make and stuff like that. If the UFC comes to you with an Ian Gary fight, you're going to say yes, and you're not going to need all these stipulations. So stop acting like you're just not going to fight the guy who's like done better than... I don't like Ian Gary, but he's proven to be a better fighter than Colby Covington in the last two years. So yeah, also back to Jack Della and why he should be ranked above Colby. Since Colby's last win, Jack Della Maddalena has fought, I believe, five times or six times. I'm not sure. Um, it's on screen right now, but I can't see it. He's fought like five or six times. Um, he fought, who did he fight? He fought Ramazan Amiv, Danny Roberts, Randy Brown, Basil Hafez, Kevin Holland, and Gilbert Burns. Finished Gilbert Burns. Finished Randy Brown, who is also a just outside the rankings guy. Won against Kevin Holland. Only reason he doesn't finish him is because no one does. But... He has two wins over top 15 guys. That's two more than you. 
and also has other good wins too. And he's an active fighter that's getting finishes, that's proving himself. Colby Covington, it's not his fault in terms of he's not the one that places himself in the rankings, but just him as a whole, get your shit together, fucking heal up, stop bitching, stop making random social media videos, give up on this gimmick, we all know you're a fucking tard, and yeah, get back in the cage later this year. If you can make it for International Fight Week, that'd be good. If not, you want to stay out for longer, be a bitch, you know, fight MSG, Madison Square Garden, that'd be cool. And yeah, actually prove yourself before you start talking shit again and stop acting like you didn't just get embarrassed by Leon Edwards. So yeah, we move on though to the next rant. Now I want to talk about people that are just throwing around the fraud check narrative way too much. And look, I will be the first one to say, I did believe Buenar St. Denis was going to win. And in my video where I said which fighters did and didn't live up to expectations, I put Buenar St. Denis as failed to live up to expectations or like didn't perform as expected. I put him in that second lowest tier. I didn't put him in terrible performance. I said, did not have the performance I expected. So I'll be the first one to say that. And I picked him to win. But people are being stupid. Sorry, bro. Losing to the number three guy after winning the first round is not a fraud check. But our St. Denis, he's, ad- he's as advertised. Anyone that was like, obviously, Lucas Tracy was glazing a little bit too much. He was doing tricks on it. But People that actually knew what they were fucking watching knew that Buenar St. Denis, we knew his head movement was shit. We knew his defense wasn't good. No, that, that he didn't get exposed in that aspect. We already knew that was there. He just stood on the feet for too long with Poirier with his hands down. That's how he gets cracked. That's what it is. But we knew before this, the people that were picking him, pretty much everyone was saying he was going to grapple Poirier and he was going to dominate him on the ground, which he did in the first, but then unfortunately... And don't call it excuses, it's just factually correct. He had staph, he was on antibiotics. Antibiotics and staph infection are both known to heavily affect your gas tank and your cardio. So, stop acting like this guy is just a bum and he had no business being in there with Poirier when he literally just dominated the first round and Poirier had basically no moments. Even on the feet, he was pressuring Poirier a little bit. But I believe everything he says when he... Look, am I going to say he would have beat Poirier... If he didn't have staff and antibiotics, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. That That's hindsight 2020. We don't know how it would have gone. But to act like having staff and having to take antibiotics is not going to affect you at all is just delusional because it does. Um, it majorly affects your gas tank. It makes you feel flat as hell. And you could tell. Normally, he pushes that grappling pace way harder and for way longer. Like against Moises, dominated the first round just like he did against Poirier and then continued to just wear on him and broke Moises down. Fair play, Poirier. He's a gritty veteran. He's not just going to give up. But Bernard dominated the first. He took him down in the second. Obviously, Poirier kept jumping gillies. But to act like Bernard just had no moments and he got ran through and dominated and he has no business in the top 15 is stupid. He would, I still think beat most guys in the rankings. I think he would beat majority of them because how many people have that kind of boxing as Poirier? Obviously, I would say he loses to Islam, loses to Oliveira, loses to Poirier, loses to Gaethje, probably loses to Armin. Even Chandler fight, I think he's 50-50. I think he beats Gamrot. I think he beats um, like he beats Benil. Fazeev, I think, is a close fight. Fazeev doesn't have that same boxing as Poirier, man, I'm telling you. I think he beats Dan Hooker. I think he beat... Jalen Turner's a tough one, but if he gets him down, I think he dominates him. Like, to act like this guy is just a bum and terrible is stupid. So, yeah. Bernard St. Denis, still a top guy. Still, I think, a top 10 easily, maybe even top 8 lightweight in the world. The striking, for sure, needs work. Obviously, the hands down is not going to be directly correlated to the staff infection. We knew that his hands were down. He doesn't have the best defense. He's very green in MMA. But for someone who started MMA training like five, seven years ago, made his UFC debut in 2020, the improvements he's made, and he started as a like less than a year ago, July 2022, sorry, July 23, he was a plus 220 underdog against Bonfim. He then beats Bonfim, beats Moises, beats Frivola in the space of like five months, and then he loses to Poirier. So to act like this guy's just done, he's 28 years of age, he's going to come back, he's still an incredible fighter. There's not a whole lot of people that you can list that just ragdoll and dominate Poirier in the first round. It just doesn't happen heaps. Like, Oliveira took until the second round to really get things going for himself. So, yeah, stop throwing around fraud check. You can say, I guess, exposed in terms of the striking defense, but that was already there. We knew that wasn't good. So, yeah, stop throwing around fraud check, bum, all this shit. 
but now still an elite fighter. We move on though to the next rant. Here's another one, Cheeto Vera with the copium of the century, the biggest cope I've ever seen in a hot minute. Cheeto Vera coming out with potentially the dumbest excuse post-fight I've ever heard in my life. He didn't say he was injured. He didn't say he had a bad weight cut. No, Sean O'Malley was apparently greasing his hair. Yeah, you heard me right. Obviously, Cheeto Vera, 100%, you're correct, bro. If O'Malley did not grease his hair, you dominate that fight easily. You knock him out in the first round. 100%, I get you, bro. O'Malley's a dirty cheater. How could he do this? The UFC needs to strip him of his title. What kind of disgusting person would put gel in their hair to gain an advantage? Um, the fuck are you talking about, Cheeto? Like, I'm sorry, man. I, I like you as a fighter. Like, you're a sick fighter. But... What are these excuses? And also you saying to O'Malley, uh, do you remember, uh, do you remember that sound you make, you make? How's the liver? It's like, bruv, you're gonna act like you did not get tuned up and fucked up and turned into a fucking puddle of mess in for 24 and a half minutes. And then the only reason you had that one moment of success was because O'Malley tried to chase the finish in the last 10 seconds and willingly exchanged in the pocket. Like, you think, to act like, oh, if I had one more minute, I beat him. Well, guess what, bro? If you had one more minute, he's just going to keep doing what he did to you for the whole 24 and a half minutes prior. He's going to keep you at range and keep fucking you up. You want to talk about sounds that he made? How about that sound that his fucking knee made when it connected with your jaw? Like, shut up, Cheeto. I'm sorry. You're being retarded. Um, but yeah, as you can see here with these stats on screen, obviously Cheeto is correct. Um, there were multiple moments in that fight where, you know, obviously O'Malley's greased hair definitely played a big factor and definitely cost uh, Cheeto the win. Obviously, those uh, zero takedowns from Cheeto Vera and pretty much the zero minutes of um, of c clinch control or actual like time when they made contact with each other in a grappling exchange, uh, I'm pretty sure it was zero. So yeah, Cheeto, the fuck are you talking about? Stop coping, bro. Even the coach saying like, if this fight had no time limit, it would have been a murder scene. Mate, are you, are you going to act like you were picking up any momentum? Like, are you going to act like O'Malley wasn't just schooling you for five rounds? Also, literal just coping about the rule set of MMA that you signed up for. <laughs> it's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Cheeto, I like you, but you're going to lose me and multiple people as a fan if you fucking go this copy and also him saying to Corey Sanag and he's like go make your he was chatting shit to Corey saying like go make your um like breakdown videos and stuff you dork or some shit like that like you also got 50 45 by Corey Sanag why are you shit talking the two guys that combined won 10 rounds to zero over you like what the fuck are you doing uh but we move on to the next rant cheeto stop man now for the final rant for me let's just talk about tough it's been echoed already mma guru made a video about it so yeah it's like i don't want to don't come at me in the comments and say you're stealing people's takes because some people do that but yeah mma guru already made videos about the cheeto cope and the tough situation so i'm not going to talk about him for too long i'm just going to kind of rehash what he said because it's true and there really shouldn't be any other opinion um the ultimate fighter what the fuck are they doing grasso versus shevchenko is just not it as coaches like come on what what, what are we doing here we don't need to talk about it for too long. I'm not going to get overly mad. There were so many options. Literally, I'll get, okay, I'll run through every division and I'll give you a better option that they could have done. All right. Um, flyweight. They could, Manel Cap, Manel Cap versus Muhammad Makayev, Manel Cap versus Pantoja. Any of this. Better, better option as a men's flyweight one. Bantamweight. You could have done O'Malley. You could do O'Malley. You could have done O'Malley versus Cheeto. You could have done, um, you can do O'Malley versus Marab. You can do um, like you, any of these. You can do O'Malley Sanhagen. You could do Sanhagen Marab. Any of this featherweight Ilya Volkanovsky for the rematch. You could do Ilya versus like Movza. You could do Ilya versus Holloway. You can do any of these fights. Lightweight like um, what's it called? You can like they already did Connor Chandler. You could do like Islam versus whoever he's fighting. Um, you could even like you could do any of these fights. Who who the fucks? I'm trying to think. In, like, do another Chandler one. <laughs> do do Chandler versus Connor V two. I don't know. Like welterweight Ian Gary versus Colby. Leon versus like um. You could do Leon versus Bilal. Even would actually be genuinely the tough season for Leon versus Bilal would actually be more entertaining than the fight. 
Um, yeah, Colby versus anyone. Like, Colby versus fucking Wonderboy would be a better one than this. Like, MVP versus someone. Middleweight, Drickus versus Izzy. Drickus versus Sean. Sean versus Izzy. Hums up versus Drickus. Hums up versus Sean. Hums up versus fucking Izzy. I don't know. I probably said that already. Costa versus Sean. Costa versus Drickus. Costa versus Hamza. Light heavyweight. Pereira, well, he's not really going to speak English, but even like Pereira versus Hill, you could do. Um, like, I don't know, fucking Yuri Yeer, versus Rakic. Just, they can just argue about fucking com- communism or some shit. They can just argue about 20th century European politics. Heavyweight, Aspinall versus Jones. Jones versus Stipe. Like, Garn versus Aspinall. All of these work better than fucking Grasso versus Shevchenko. Even for women's MMA. Pena versus Pennington is still better than this. Um, like, these two just aren't going to talk to each other. Like, even fucking Wei Li versus Yan Zhanan. Just have them screaming at each other in Mandarin over who's got the highest social credit score. That would be more fun than this shit, bro. And, and the prospects are actually good. The the names on there are fun. They're good people, good fighters, good prospects. I'm sure that even if, like, more than just the two winners are going to make the UFC. Like, the two, there's going to be the winners, of course. But, like, it's going to be a situation where we get a bunch of these guys in the UFC anyway. It's like short notice call-ups. It's going to be sick. The fight is going to be awesome, but there's just going to be no drama and nothing to ever watch. Like, there's going to be no, you'll do what you're told. It's going to, I'm going to pin you. Like, there's going to be none of that. There's not, not going to be any Conor McGregor shoving Michael Chandler in the face. And even that se- season was not that good, but at least it had something. Like, this is just going to be dead. Uh, but that is it for my rants. Now let's take a look at what the people have to say. All right, we got the first rant here. So people shitting and turning on BSD, um, Lucas, that's what he's saying here, saying he was only hyped because he lost up to knockout beating the backs off Dustin. Yeah, I get you. Antibiotics, glazing MVP. Also, you're saying people glazing MVP after shitting on him and saying Holland didn't... Yeah, I'm not going to I'm not gonna disagree. Your fight was kind of dead. And then also you're saying O'Malley glazing like Vera isn't a punching bag. Fair enough. That's what you've got to say. I agree with most of it. Obviously, I talked about the BSD thing before. Um, I haven't talked about MVP much. Look, I wasn't... It was a good win, I guess. Holland's just not all that good. And then also, yeah, the people that are saying O'Malley versus Cheeto was the best title defense ever. You've never seen an Alexander Volkanovsky fight. You've never seen... Like, Leon's um, rematch against... Or Leon's trilogy against Usman was a better title defense quality of opposition-wise. Um, like, there's just so many better ones, honestly. Like, Volk versus Holloway, Volk versus Ortega, Volk versus Yair. All of these better. Um, like, a bunch of Jones's ones back in the day. A bunch of Anderson Silva's ones. Izzy versus, um, uh, Costa. Again, similar, similar, similar scenario. Not a great fighter, but looked even, like, looked great. Yeah, there's just way too many here. Like, Khabib's title defenses, so yeah. I agree with you. Um, well, let's move on to the next person. All right, this next guy wants to know how Usman Namagamedov would go in the UFC. So not really a rant, just a question. I'd say he would be probably like a top, just around top 15 guy, like just like a competitive with like, competitive with the Moicanos and stuff of the world. I'm not going to be deterred by that. The people that glaze Bellator and PFL fighters, I was going to make that a rant, but I was like, it's not super like timely to right now. But yeah, I think he'd go okay. He wouldn't be a bum, but yeah, he would definitely not be. A- Everyone's like, oh, if Islam left and moved up to welterweight, Usman Namagomedov would be champion. I'm like, shut up. He's a Bellator fighter. They're not that good. Uh, let's move on to the next question though. Okay, so Ayugli wants to know, do you feel like the meta is shifting to crotch sniffing control time and neutralization of your opponent rather than going for damage and trying to end the fight or has it always been like that? Um, I'd say it's always kind of been a mixture of both. It's just stylistically and also who they're fighting. Like sometimes people on bottom are going to be real scrambly and they are trying to make you work and then you have to work. But if you're versing guys that just don't know how to get up from bottom, I think people are just going to do the same thing. They're not going to put in extra effort. Um, but let's continue. What would would be interesting to hear from you personally, I feel like there's always been the lay and pay guys. Yeah, for sure. And the boring people that hold you down and obliterate you, weakest volume. Yeah, yeah, ground and pound. Um, more common, Dagestani guys, Gamrot, Jelton, Bilal. Yeah. So like Gamrot, there's different styles of grappling. This is what I'll end on. Gamrot, there's like the takedown spanners. There's the ones that don't even get control time, like the Marabs and the Gamrots. I'd say Marab's actually not even that boring because he actually like is just always going. But like Gamrot's like the one that just 
or it just shoots and shoots and shoots. No control time. Then there's like some of the Dagestanis are like the lay and pray guys. And Jelton is also kind of a um he's a mixture of both. Because in the Derek Lewis fight, he was a lay and pray guy. And then in the Blades fight in the first round, he was just a takedown spammer. Um Bilal isn't even like a major takedown lay and pray guy because he doesn't actually get heaps of takedowns, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I get what you mean. Some of the Dagestani guys do actually... Like, fair play, Khabib, bro, his ground and pound was sick. That was awesome. Islam never been like a massive ground and pound guy. Like, against Volk, he just took the back and held him there for a whole lot. Um, but yeah, I get it. So It's just going to be different. Like, it just depends on... Um, something Lucas said, which I disagreed with. He, he said Pantoja's just a half-guard camper. Like, we're going to act like just because of two top, like, Roy Val and Moreno, the number, like, one and two guy in the division, uh, he just didn't finish them. But, like, before that, you know, subbed Perez, subbed Roy Val, he subbed Moreno on tough. Like, we're going to sub, like, beat Schnell. We're going to act like this guy just never gets finishes. Like, come on now. Let's move on, though, to the next question. Okay, so we got Groot saying, Volk did not lose his edge. He was unlucky two times in a row and will smash Ilya to Poirier in the rematch. Look, man, I would love to say I think that's going to happen, but I just don't see it. It's just not how the sport goes. Once you lose the belt, you just don't win it back, unfortunately. So I would love it to happen. I wish it would happen. And he did lose twice in a row, um, but I don't know. Look, do I think he could come back and have like a close fight with Ilya? Probably. Do I think he probably still gets finished? Just, yeah. Uh, it's not even about Volk being like a bad fighter. Like Volk's an incredible fighter, and he doesn't even have a bad chin, but it's like... Bro, Ilya's just got the ability to just say, fuck it, I'm just going to swing really hard and I'm going to land any of these punches on you and you're just going to die. Because unless you literally have a fucking brick for a chin, you're just not taking all these shots. So yeah, I think Ilya's just got a really bad style for Volk. Like, it just doesn't work for him. That guy, I, I would love to see Volk mix in more like wrestling. If he just only wrestled in the rematch, if he just goes out there and just... I wouldn't even care if he just lay and praise Ilya. Like, if he just gets him down and just holds him there for the whole time, if he wins his belt back, I don't even care, bro. I'll defend that man to the end of time, even if it's the worst fight ever. That's kind of what he needs to do. Just be boring as fuck and wrestle the whole time. But I just don't see it happening, unfortunately. Uh, let's move on, though, to the next question. Next one we've got... Can we talk about how useless 301's going to be? I mean, there's going to be a stinker pay-per-view... But this, what were they thinking? Fair enough. And this is actually a good time to talk about this because they just announced Steve Urseg versus Pantoja for 301. Hopefully, like I love both guys, but I hope it's not the main event. Let's be real. But yeah, 301, I think that's just what was going to happen. Like the usually the May and the June pay-per-view is never that good. Um, like if you remember last year, it was Jones versus Garn, Izzy versus Pereira, and then Cejudo versus Sterling, and then Nunes versus Aldana. Like... They give you a couple stacked ones, and then after that one, it was then International Fight Week. Like they give you a couple stacked ones, and then you just got to take a bit of a a bit of a break and a bit of a shit, just a little bit of a shit break for pay per views, and you're not gonna get fucking bangers. But three hundred one, man. Like there's some good fights on there, but you know what I think they should do? Just make it a fight night. And you know what? If they did that, the the, the fucking narrative around this would immediately change. Because right now, everyone's like, this pay-per-view's dog shit. Why is Ursa getting a title shot? There's no one good on the card. They ruined it, all this. You know what happens if you make it a fight night? Everyone goes, oh, sick, we got a title fight for free. This card's great. This is awesome. Immediately. If you just don't make people pay for it, which is like rough, because then you don't, yeah, no, there's no pay-per-view points. But I think that would definitely save the narrative around this and yeah i think that's what they should do uh but we move on to another question we're going to run through this quickly now we got this one saying kane is the heavyweight goat ian gary should die dustin is a cuck and whaley is korean sick good job uh we move on to the next question uh, first take here Pereira, poria o'malley khabib fans most annoying in the sport and then 301 should be cancelled or move a week back and held in vegas it shouldn't be moved to vegas i think they can keep it as the brazil card of course but make it a fight night and then as for your other thing i th i agree i think all of those are relevant or so all of those are valid uh in terms of not great fans we move on, though, to the next question. Next one. Well, I talked about this before. Fighters wanting to go up without defending the belt. I think it's terrible, and I think it shouldn't be allowed. But the UFC is going to do it anyway because they want money. Uh, yeah, let's move on. Another one on that same thing. New champs automatically calling out champ for a title shot, not defending. Agree. Also, grounded knees should be legal. 100%. You're cooking. Valid opinions. Let's move on. Drickus pussing out of finding dog bender for the second time. 
I don't think he's pussying out. I just think he didn't want to fight 300, which is fair enough. Uh, I'm not going to call him a pussy for it. Yeah, whatever. I think the fight's going to happen anyway. Let's move on. All right. Pat Barry's my hero. Korean zombies, Chinese. Izzy takes back shots from Blood Diamond and Usman Mogs hums up for fi- in a five-rounder. Uh, Pat Barry, hero, interesting. Zombie, all right, fair enough. Izzy, back shots with Blood Diamond, definitely possible. And then what was your last one? Uh, fucking, yeah, sure, I agree. All right, this next one, yep, I agree, 100%. Approve. Next question. Old heads are the worst fans in the sport. They'll ramble on about delusional shit like Fedor and Krokop smokes Aspinall, Anderson smokes Strickers. If you argue, yeah, I agree. Uh, that's something I've always thought for a while. Anytime I tell someone that the quality of the sport has improved and fighters are better now than they were 10 years ago, like, nah, man, you don't know. Anderson Silva in his prime was a wizard, man. Like, yeah, sure, he was great, incredible striker, but. He was versing people that didn't know how to fucking throw punches with correct technique. Um, So, yeah, I agree. And even, like, Anderson, it's different because at least he was somewhat modern day, I guess. But, yeah, with the fucking, the pre-2000s guys, they literally, like, I'm sorry, hate to say this, you're going to hate me, but I'm going to just be honest. Like, the heavyweight champions from, like, when the UFC started to, like, 2000 would literally lose to fucking Sergei Spivak today. That's just, that That would just happen. Uh, let's move on, though. All right, we got this guy saying he thinks Sugar will be the grand, greatest bantamweight of all time if he beats Marab Sanhagen. Uh, yeah, it would be close. I would say not quite, though, because if he did that, it would be a... His notable wins would be a close decision against Yarn. If he, like, let's just say he cuts it there completely, nothing else after that. It would be a close decision against Yarn, a knockout over Aljo, great win. A five-round domination over punching bag Cheeto. Uh, and then what, Marab and San... If he beat Marab and San Egan, look, so that would be what? Three... No, yeah, hang on. Three defences, so that would be equal to, uh, what, Aljo or Cruz or whatever. I, I think he would need one more to solidify it, but in terms of level of competition, that would definitely be solid. All right, this one's saying, pick 10 fighters you think should change weight division and how they would go. All right, I'm not going to pick 10 and I'm not going to go through the entire rankings, but just off the top of my head, I think Almeida should try and cut to light heavyweight. Uh, I think Costa should go up to light heavyweight because light heavyweight's terrible. Um, I think... I wouldn't mind seeing Roy Val go up to um to Bant. Actually, no, scratch that. That's a terrible idea. Um, if Marab... I doubt it, but if Marab could somehow make flyweight, he would dominate everyone. Peter Yarn, nah, not Peter Yarn. Uh, I don't know, man. Like, I think Volk at this stage in his career should just go up to 55 just for money fights. I think Colby should actually try and be a weight bully and cut to 55. I think Gary should cut to 55 too. He's going to get outsized by everyone. Uh, Usman, I wouldn't. I think Usman should go to middleweight because middleweights are well known for being terrible. So Usman should definitely go to middleweight. Um, if Adesanya loses to Drickus, and Pereira, like, he sh- if Adesanya loses to Drickus, just go up to light heavyweight. Uh, anything else? I don't know. Yeah, maybe Pereira go up to heavyweight if Aspinall isn't champ. Like, yeah, I don't know. A couple, like, Zhang Wei Li should move up. Um, I think she beats everyone at 25, except Blanchfield. Blanchfield should move up to Bantamweight because they all suck. She could be a double champ, honestly. Yeah, that's all I got to think about that one. I've already talked about this one too. Bo Nickel over Charles on 300. 100% agree. Should be on the prelims, definitely. Next one. Uncle Ive wouldn't have haters if he was named John Smith. People hate on him and group on him with boring fighters. I mean, yeah, he's fun sometimes, but he's also not fun. And also saying... He, would ha- he wouldn't have haters if his name was John Smith. If my aunt had balls, she'd be my uncle. Like, the fuck, reality exists. You got to go with what you've got. He is boring sometimes. Sometimes he's fun. That's how it is. Uh, we got another person calling out the O'Malley glazing here. Easiest title defense possible. No, I don't think he chins everyone in the top five. I think he would end up having to just do a decision style against a lot of guys. But yeah, fair enough. Uh, Hamzat still hasn't fought. You are correct. Where is he? All right, next one here. All right, this is a big one. Jones is out of the goat, uh, the goat conversation, and his legacy is more tarnished than Dillashaw's. People glazing feeds his delusion. Next point, you're saying BJ Penn is the lightweight goat. I gotta disagree. Uh, fights like Strickland, DDP, uh, Grasso, Shevchenko, Jones, Gustafson, among others, should be analysed and used to develop a more fair, consistent judging criteria. That's fair enough. That would be a good one. Uh, Dana White always said proudly, UFC does not make gimmick fights, but denying. Aspinall is title shot. Yeah, 
fair play for all of those valid points. I would say, I wouldn't say Jones is out of goes goat conversation. If you don't include Roids, then for sure he is. Um, but you can't be like, oh, maybe. Like he's either he's either number one or he's not there. And then I don't think BJ Penn's the fifty-five goat. It's just tough. Uh, let's move on. This one, Umar doesn't deserve Corey. You're speaking my language, bro. 100% agree. All right, last one. Chandler forever getting strung along by the UFC. Never happened. Got kicked out of top five after Goat Rot beat Hardy A. Chandler might be one of the most unfortunate fighters in the UFC. See you at the top. Man's literally been out for a year and four months. <laughs> what the fuck is he doing? Connor, you're not, he's not getting the Connor fight, little bro. You're gonna, they're gonna announce in like, August, they're gonna wait. They're gonna make you wait till August, and then they're gonna announce Connor is fighting fucking like Poirier or some shit, or Connor's coming back and fighting for the fucking t- welterweight title, and they're gonna be like, "Sorry, Chandler. Sorry, bud. You, you, you're fighting fucking. <laughs> who, who, who would they give him? I don't know. You, you're, fi- you're fighting Jalen Turner. He's like, what do I mean? I have to fight Turner? I wanted to adopt him. Um, but yeah, I don't know. They're gonna give him someone like that. It's just gonna be rough for uh, for Chandler. Uh, but that'll do it, guys. Hope you enjoyed this video. Went so much longer than I expected because, I mean, that's the thing about rants is when you get going, you can't stop and you just want to keep fucking getting annoyed and saying more things. So yeah, went on for a very long time. If you did somehow stick around for all of this, I respect you immensely. Even if you watched a bit of it and skipped to the end, I also respect you. Thanks for watching. Leave your takes and your rants and shit in the comments. You know, uh, unless you want Bilal as champion or Ian Gary as champion, you should like the video. And also you should subscribe unless you want Raquel Pennington to coach the next season of Tough. So yeah, that'll do it. Peace out.